Great. So without further ado, welcome to the Zuma Scientist series. This series is sponsored by Lake Champlain Sea Grant, UVM Extension, SUNY Plattsburgh's education program known as Watershed Alliance. Lake Champlain Sea Grant develops and shares science-based knowledge to benefit the environment and economies of the Lake Champlain Basin. Watershed Alliance is a Lake Champlain Sea Grant education program that aims to reach K-12 students and their teachers throughout the Lake Champlain Basin. Our goal is to increase awareness and knowledge of watershed issues in youth throughout Vermont and New York. The Zuma Scientist series was created in response to the current need for more virtual programs. Every Tuesday and Friday from now until the end of June, we will be hosting a guest scientist to tell us more about their research in the basin. Just as a heads up, this webinar is also currently being live streamed to our Lake Champlain Sea Grant YouTube channel. Uh, this is another avenue for teachers and students and folks in the general public to view these presentations. Uh, all previous and future webinars will be archived and uploaded to our YouTube channel shortly after the presentation has been concluded. So this is a way to share this presentation with folks you uh, think might find it of interest and to catch up on presentations you may have missed. So today's presenter is Dr. Danielle Garneau, an associate professor from, of environmental science from SUNY Plattsburgh. Danielle is a broadly trained ecologist with a focus on wildlife ecology, primarily mammals. At Penn State University, her doctoral work addressed movement patterns of black bear in relation to moose parturition in Alaska. She adapted her doctoral research question from pulsed moose prey for bear and wolves to pulsed mass and their small mammal seed predators to better accommodate student research opportunities. Recently, her research has focused on microplastic pollution in Lake Champlain food webs and wastewater treatment plant effluent, roadkill surveys using a smartphone app, field and molecular, molecular surveys of Lyme disease, turtle demographic and home range studies using mark recapture radio telemetry techniques, as well as other citizen science endeavors. She has grown her research and teaching skills through participation in projects within the Ecological Research as Education Network. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our presenter, Danielle, to talk about microplastics in freshwater systems. So I'll stop sharing my screen and you can take it away, Danielle. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today. Nate, can we see the PowerPoint? Yep, you're all good. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, and, and that introduction really covers how all over the place I am in terms of research. I'm just pretty curious. Um, I am a wildlife ecologist and, um, and aquatic work was very new to me. So I was grateful in 2012 when I was approached by um, our grants office to participate in a SUNY wide uh, grant that basically um, allowed our students to make a match with another SUNY school researcher that was doing research different from what was offered at our own campus. And in doing so, I was able to connect my students with someone doing uh, microplastic research over at SUNY Fredonia, um, someone by the name of Sherry Mason, who's renowned for, for identifying microplastics in freshwater systems. Um, in doing so, I, I launched um, a collaboration that has changed the trajectory of my research interests um, and just brought me much more connected, I think, to the region and to the incredible water body that we all share, um, which is Lake Champlain. So today I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about um, this research. It's pretty um, wide in scope. We've done work in wastewater treatment plants. We've done work in organisms um, and we're starting to test some new techniques um, that might make it easier for us to quantify and characterize these plastics um, and then also look at stuff on land. So there may be some microplastic inputs that are coming in off um, land-based sources. So um, to begin, just putting my email up there in case you have any questions that we don't um, get a chance to get to, feel free to shoot me a message later. But these two visuals really show that inputs of plastic are coming in from a bunch of different uh, 
uh, sources um, and pathways that begin with us. We are that um, initial source of plastic. So you can see coming in from the atmosphere, coming in through uh, beauty products, um, coming in through washing of clothing uh, and tire wear and so on. So there's multiple pathways um, of plastic that um, again, originally are deriving from our usage. I have a lot of pictures on the next slide. So I think that's why it's maybe hung up. Technical difficulties right out the gate. <laughs> there we go. Um, so these beautiful faces are my students. And without these faces, these people, these incredible hardworking students, uh, none of this research could have happened. It takes many hours to sample and to look and categorize under the microscope. And they are amazing troopers. Um, this research has been supported not only by that grant, but also by um, C grant funding. Um, to continue the work uh, longer term. So again, we are grateful and we are plugging this um, sort of survey work um, into our classes so that we can have even greater um, reach and connection with students. So to start, what is plastic, plastic pollution, our use, our connection? Um, we know we have a, an incredible dependence um, on plastics. I had a son who spent some time in the NICU. I know the value of using plastic, say for um, IV bags, right? There is an essential need for plastic. It's easy um, to mold. It is very lightweight. Uh, it can be mass produced. And again, it has really important uses. Um, and for that reason, it has skyrocketed in use since the 1950s. And you can see here world production um, of plastic um, since the beginning uh, has increased back in 2012, 288 million tons um, projections from 2017, even greater and onward. Um, where is that plastic going? A lot of it is not going where we think it is. I think a lot more people think that recycling is really the end and landfilling is really the end, but a lot of it is unaccounted for as well. So where does it end up? Um, I know you've seen a lot of these pictures. It ends up in water bodies, it ends up in organisms, it ends up in these massive gyres in the ocean, um, in these marine systems um, where they circulate um, and um, cause uh, undue harm. But the story that we're gonna be looking into is something much smaller than the macroplastics. Um, the, ma the macroplastics are larger in size and we find in those gyres. We're gonna be looking at an even finer scale at microplastics. And so I wanna by definition explain what that is. These are plastics that are smaller in size than five millimeters and they can be two types. We can have um, secondary microplastics and we can have primary microplastics and the primary microplastics were designed to be that tiny. They're the industrial pellets that get melted down and then formed into other products um, or they're the beads and um, in face washes or in abrasive toothpastes. Uh, whereas a secondary microplastic is one that is larger and gets broken down over time either by wave action, sunlight, mechanical degrada degradation to become something smaller, something in that five millimeter size range or less. And what we do in our lab and many others who study microplastics is to categorize them. Um, and the characterization methods um, are many folds. Uh, oftentimes we will focus on cat categorizing them by type, whether they're fibers, films, foams, beads, um, uh, we can do it by color, we can do it by polymer type using a Fourier transform infrared, um, a chemistry machine that we have up in our other departments, um, or using other types of spe spectroscopy that'll tell us what exact polymer type we have. And that's important because polymers have different densities and so they'll float and reside in different locations in the water body and therefore they encounter different organisms and be more of kind of a menace to organisms, say the lighter ones that are floating at the top and the epilimnion are gonna be exposed to different organisms than say those that are heavier like PVC that would be down in the benthos. Um, 
And so we'll kind of evaluate that. Um, as I mentioned, these plastics are, you know, in our everyday life. This is where they're coming in from. Um, they're coming in from tire wear, they're coming in from paints, they're coming in from loss in production, washing of our clothing, um, pathways through wastewater treatment, um, illegal dumping, dust, which I'll talk about later on, um, and our beauty products, as well as food packaging. Um, and so where does it end up? As we mentioned, it can end up in marine systems in those gyres, in smaller water bodies, fresh water bodies. We also are finding locales of higher density. Um, the collaborator that I mentioned, Sherry Mason, my mentor, is from SUNY Fredonia. She did surveys in the Great Lakes to look at levels of microplastic, concentrations of microplastic. And we are focused on the Lake Champlain Basin. And so we are fortunate to be in the same uh, building and collaborate with um, Tim Myhook and his staff in Lake Champlain Research Institute. They've been doing long-term monitoring of Lake Champlain for uh, zooplankton communities and how they've turned over over time since say the early 1990s. Um, they save all these samples. They're looking for invasive species, say like the spiny water flea. Um, and we've been able to go back and look through those samples and see if there are any microplastics. So we obviously haven't gone through all the samples, but we've made our way through a handful. And so these are some of the trends. I want to just show you, these are nurdles that we've been finding. They're pre-production um, rubber particles in this case um, that were found in a lot of these samples. And notice these locations here along Lake Champlain, these are the locations where the zooplankton are sampled for the long-term monitoring. So we actually have a time and a location, so a spatial and temporal distribution of these um, nurdles. Um, over time. And so I just wanted to share some of the early findings on that research. In samples, and again, we haven't gone through all of them, but in samples in 2010, 2011, we did not see any of those nurdles. In 2012 and 2013, we began seeing these pre-production rubber, um, and we were seeing some hot spots by color, um, red meaning it's a little bit more intense in size, meaning the concentration was a little bit greater in these areas. Um, and then the next years that we went through, again, apologize for the size of these pictures delaying, um, a little less in concentration um, and still seeing certain hot spots. So we really were curious where they came from, if it happened all at once, if it was a lake-wide event, or whether or not um, we could pinpoint a source. Um, and so, you know, seeing that they came on around, um, you know, that, that period of time, 20, 2012, 2013, from what we've seen so far, and that there are hot spots, but they're in different locations around the lake, gave us pause to think that perhaps this was a lake-wide event. It doesn't time exactly with the rising waters that we saw in the flood, um, but there could have been a lag time in them surfacing and getting up into the samples. Um, so we're going to continue researching that to try and trace back um, where that ultimate source of um, nurdles might actually be. So again, where else are they coming from? We're finding in research that they're coming in from land inputs. This is a survey uh, in, from Sherry Mason and her colleagues. Um, and what you'll notice is they went through um, these tributaries. So they're surveying streams in the Great Lakes system. Um, along the x-axis here, you'll notice these are those tributaries. And they did a GIS analysis. They basically buffered those streams and were able to determine the proportion of land use around those tributaries. And you can see that kind of laid out here. So for example, in um, Rouge, uh, Michigan is very much an urban um, area. And if you look up here, you're seeing plastics by type, categorized by type. So those systems, those tributaries that were mostly urban, if we look up here, they had a lot of fragments, they had a lot of foams, they had a lot of films. Um, you can see one in particular, I'm not going to pick the right one here, but as you scroll down, one in particular tributary had a lot of fibers. And over here, if you wanted to see where most of the beads were, you could trace that back down over here to Buffalo. Um, so interesting research kind of suggesting that land use um, can contribute 
Um, notice over here, when we look at the lakes, the concentration of particles varies by lake. There's different densities, human populations on those lakes, so different levels of industry in the lake, size of lake is varying. Um, lake Erie has the highest concentration of plastics, but the tributary is even higher. So they're deriving um, in many cases from um, land along those tributaries. And if you look at the composition, the type of plastic coming in in the Great Lakes, fragments are being um, located uh, in majority, and then in the tributaries, a lot of fibers. So that was interesting research in 2016. Um, as I mentioned, we started this research in, um, you know, looking at wastewater treatment plants, um, and that they could potentially be pathways of plastic from our use um, in our, our household um, every day. And so our students would go out to the wastewater treatment plants. We went out to quite a few, several in Plattsburgh, um, several in New York, um, Plattsburgh, Ticonderoga, also over Burlington, uh, Virgins, St. Albans. Um, and we sampled for 24 hours using a sump pump and a hose and got a loading of plastics. Um, these are a 24 hour sample uh, coming in uh, wastewater treatment plant that's been treated and just about to exit into um, the water body. Now I should mention wastewater treatment plants are excellent at what they were designed to do, which is to remove um, particulate and, and mostly larger particulate in addition to a lot of chemicals such as phosphorus. Um, they were never designed um, to pick up something as small as five millimeter in size. Um, and this is across the board. They're excellent at what they do. They are a pathway of this particulate um, but we are that ultimate source. So just showing you some visuals of that and just wanting to let you guys know that these wastewater treatment plants are like people. Everyone is different. They serve certain um, population centers, different, um, you know, different densities. They were built at different times. Some treat um, uh, 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 overflow, combined sewer overflow in high rain events. Um, some, uh, need to have in infrastructural upgrades. Some have tertiary treatment, an additional stage of processing after um, the typical settling out. Um, and so you can imagine that because of that, because each is different, um, the type of particle that uh, we see in greatest abundance would, would differ as well. And you can see that across our plants that were surveyed. Um, here in, for example, Virgens has a lot of fibers. Um, but again, they're, they're actually emitting um, quite a bit less than some of the larger um, metropolitan areas. This is a sample from, um, from St. Albans. You can see there's a lot of foam in this sample, um, and that was a 24-hour sample. Why is this important? We know how much is, is uh, transferring from our sump pump in a 24-hour period and giving us this much total plastic, microplastic. Now, if we know how much is coming out and how much water is being treated, in a plant in a 24 hour period, we can scale up what we found on our sieve in a sump pump to the amount that might be entering into the system on a 24 hour period for that particular plant. And you can see it's not insignificant. Um, and if you think of all the plants that are al along our watershed, um, you can imagine that this is a pathway that is worth considering as well. Um, and, and you can see this survey that we were participating in with Sherry Mason um, fibers um, across the board were some of the, the largest contributing particles um, that we saw in these samples. I apologize, I've got some big images here. Um, and so you probably remember that beads, there was a big worry about beads, microbeads coming in in these samples, and that is true. Um, and with getting messaging out and more research being done, there was a, a federal ban on beads, which is exciting to see our, re our research, not just mine, but um, so many others helping to inform policy. And also moving forward, thinking about films, right? Our bag ban in New York, which I know with COVID is kind of, we're having to step back, um, but this is also exciting movement, um, thinking about our use of single use plastic. Um, but what we need to focus attention on moving forward is another type, the fibers. And so you can see here, there's a lot of research turning to atmospheric deposition. They're finding it in the Rocky Mountains. They're finding it in the Pyrenees and these high elevation, fairly pristine areas where they wouldn't have expected to find this particulate. And why should we care? 
because we breathe this in um, and other organisms are being impacted as well. So research is now moving towards, um, are there cellular responses in humans and other organisms? Are we seeing any negative impacts of these particulate? Um, Sherry Mason has focused her attention on water. She's looking at water bottles. She's got a, a study out that shows 93%. She surveyed quite a few different company brands um, across the, the globe. 93% of them contained plastic and they were very much of tiny size. Um, and in terms of the polymer type, mostly polypropylene. And she also did a survey of beer that might be of interest to some people um, and also sea salt um, and they found plastics in all of those samples um, as well. You think about the load in a year. We should be a little bit concerned because a lot of our food is packaged right and so there are scientists that are now beginning to get concerned and think about alternatives to food packaging and also many of us eat um, organisms that are in these water bodies that might be exposed to these particulate. And so think of consuming shellfish, oysters, mussels. Um, these are filter feeders that would be uptaking a lot of this particulate. Um, and so there are studies that show, you know, on average, a person might uptake 0.47 particles per gram of oyster tissue. And if you were in a country or happen to really like them, um, that may actually, you know, have a, a body burden over time. So we were interested in this sort of thing. We were able to access a lot of fish uh, with the help of um, a lot of tournament goers uh, in our region. And we looked at cormorants, which are a chalk predator birds that are eating the fish, a bunch of different species, 15 species of fish, and also some invertebrates to see if the particulate was being retained in these organisms. So we were able to dissect them. We were able to do a chemical digest on these um, to break down biological material leave behind plastic. And these were some of the take home messages. Um, time and time again, the amount of microplastic higher on the food chain um, was greater. So in cormorants that are eating as a top predator, um, we're getting a lot of plastics, a lot more than in the fish and then a lot more in the, in, than in the invertebrates. And what I want to call your attention to is the color of these bars. The color is light blue. The majority of it is light blue. That corresponds to fibers. So it seems like fibers are um, what we're seeing in the food, food chain higher up. Um, and so if we were to kind of look at the fish, all 15 species of fish and look across the board, again, it seems like those that are eating higher on the food chain um, are picking up a little bit more plastic. So now I have my first question. Awesome, so you all should see that poll question popping up now. Um, Organisms with the largest microplastic loads tend to be A, sedentary, B, top predators, C, grazers, D, herbivores. So we'll give you a few uh, more seconds to make a decision and select an answer choice. Uh, if for some reason the polling feature isn't working for you, you can go ahead and type your answer into the chat box. And same thing if you're joining us uh, via YouTube, you can type your answer into the chat box. All right, uh, we're gonna end the poll and share the results. And Danielle, I'll let you talk us through uh, this question and, and the results that we get. Yes, good stuff, you guys, A plus. Um, it is a little trickier than I kind of alluded to in this question. You'll see the invertebrates are a little bit trickier to interpret. But overall, what the trend seems to support uh, in terms of research is that higher up on the food chain, top predators um, that might be um, eating, uh, you know, a lot more biomass might be uh, uptaking more uh, particulate in the course of their lifetime. So well done. You are right. Top predators. So again, it gets a little trickier when we look closer um, down that food chain um, towards the bottom. And so we looked at Riley Masterson, our student looked at a bunch of different organisms that are invertebrates. So the smaller things, they have different behaviors, some shred, some graze, some are herbivorous, some are filter feeders, some are predators. Um, and um, you can see that it was very much species specific in this case. We did see high loads in, in the predators, some in the filter feeders, which you can kind of expect that would be the case. But again, big thing to consider, um, mostly fibers that we're finding in these organisms. 
and you can see a visual right here. And we take that particulate and put it under that FTIR spectroscopy machine, as I mentioned, to figure out what polymer it is. We're seeing largely a lot of poly, um, ethylene polyester type fabrics, also some rayon and nylon across the board with these organisms and what they're uptaking. Um, this is Aaron Ashline who went through an incredible amount of um, particulate to evaluate that. So that was exciting stuff. So what I'm trying to kind of get across is this is very much a story of fibers now as we turn our attention and are learning more. Um, we have to think about our use of, of microfibers, think of our synthetic clothing, um, and how we might be contributing. Um, but there's momentum building, just like we saw with the beads, just like we saw with the films, right? Um, and I think it's important for us to note that places like, um, I'm sorry, California and Connecticut have bills already put forth to change labeling to suggest that anything with greater than 50% synthetic, um, uh, composed of synthetic, um, could potentially be sloughing off and shedding um, when washed, and that it can cause um, a negative impact to fish and shellfish, uh, and again, up the food chain. So very exciting to see that happening. And there's a lot of initiatives, uh, manufacturers that are looking at alternative, um, less synthetic uh, product uh, in their uh, designs, uh, Burton, Patagonia kind of moving forward with this. We've got um, aftermarket um, filters. This is the lint lover. Um, we have Coraball from, um, uh, this is from the Rosalia project out of uh, uh, Vermont. Um, you can throw this in your wash um, to catch some of the fibers. It's meant to act like a, a coral catching um, particulate. This is um, Patagonia's guppy friend bag. Again, you can stuff your clothing in there and throw it in the wash and it can help in collecting some of that particulate, which you can then collect off and landfill. Um, so question, I think I've been too easy. <laughs> question two. Great. Yeah. So I just launched that second poll. Uh, moving forward, our attention and efforts must focus on the most ubiquitous plastic particle type as it is being found in air and dust. So if you've been paying attention, Danielle's been talking about what is uh, the most ubiquitous plastic particle and, and where she thinks we should be focusing uh, our efforts. So you can go ahead and select that answer in the poll. And again, if uh, the polling feature isn't working for you, you can go ahead and type an answer into the chat box. Uh, same thing if you're joining us on YouTube. Just give you a, a few more seconds here to select your answer. All right, I'm gonna end the poll and share the results. And Danielle, I'll let you uh, take over. Okay. Awesome. Fibers, yes, fibers are the ones we have to turn our attention to. These sneaky things, they're even smaller in many cases. And uh, and so just learning more about them, uh, where the major source and pathways are and thinking of alternatives is very important. So I wanted to kind of let us uh, talk a little bit about our role and what choices we might make moving forward. One of the things, again, thinking of us as consumers, you know, how can we reduce our use and dependence on plastics? Um, thinking about clothing and those personal care products. If you are about to shift out your uh, laundering uh, washer dryer, it is much better if you can to get a front loader, which um, the agitation rate is different. There's much less um, fibers that uh, research has shown are being emitted off of a front loader than a top loader. Um, and then also in terms of detergent, powder seems to be um, a little bit worse than liquid and none, um, no detergent is even better than um, the liquid, but if you have to go, then liquid they've suggested seems to, to have uh, less of an abrasive property um, and reduce reduces the amount of um, fibers that you might see. Consider some of those alternative um, or um, products that might help in capturing some of those fibers. Um, bringing your own bags to stores, banning your bottles, having your recyclable bottles and utensils, bamboo utensils if possible, uh, bamboo toothbrushes. There's a lot of options out there these days. Balloons, say no to them, as well as straws. Um, and to-go containers are tricky, especially nowadays when we're sort of limited to that. 
um, and you know push with corporate um, if possible. There are a lot of things that we can do uh, in our everyday and we're just one person but one person has a great impact over their lifetime and we speak and have impacts on others. So it's really important I think for us to kind of talk about this and get the messaging out there that we have to be considering it. I wanted to end, I know I've, I've kind of gone over time but I wanted to end showing you some of the exciting stuff we're doing in our lab moving forward. Um, Sherry Mason collaborated on that beer and salts and water project with Dr. Mary Kosuth. Um, she has been mentoring us in this new technique, which I just think is so cool, um, to use UV light and Nile red staining to perhaps, which we have learned is, is binding to plastics um, and can connecting to a computer program that can then um, actually quantify and characterize for you and help in automating this process, which I think would be fabulous. Um, Carly and I started working on this and then COVID shut us down. So kind of bummed about that, but we are definitely gonna move forward with that. Um, and she and I were really interested in, um, you know, we had learned that there are products out there, um, these, you know, natural type fertilizers that are derived from wastewater treatment plant bacterial mats. Um, and they are, you know, treated, um, pelletized and sold um, over, you know, in, um, uh, you know, stores nearby uh, and marketed as fertilizer. It is fertilizer that can be broadcast on the lawn, just like your seed. Um, and so we were curious, since it derives from these bacterial mats from wastewater treatment plant processing, is it possible that that could be another pathway of um, plastic to um, water bodies and to our systems? And so we took a look at some of that product. We saw that um, a lot of fibers were found within them. These are all pictures from what we found. Um, when she did her survey. And again, if you think about, this was just in, I think 82 grams maybe that she looked at, scaling that up to the size of an average lawn and what the potential load could be um, if a lot of us were using. Um, and we were then curious um, to see if, you know, things like weed fabric, uh, fabric suppression, which oftentimes is plastic, um, if over time and that degrades into macro or micro size, can that influence um, plant growth? And there are studies out there um, on wheat. So we actually looked at corn, we did a greenhouse study, again, COVID kind of reduced our uh, longevity, we had to stop at about five weeks. Um, but we had, you know, we set up controls, we had a macroplastic treatment, a microplastic treatment, we looked at the soil amendment as well that derives from wastewater. And then on three of our six pots in each of those treatments, we added worms to see if there was some kind of an ameliorating effect. If it helped to have worms, um, how did the plant growth um, change across these treatments? So it was really exciting to do this experiment. Um, and Isabel and Ling were awesome in, um, in this project. You can see the macro plastics, we cut them up as bigger size, micro as smaller size. Um, we added the amendment, two different sizes of the amendment. We added red worms and lumbricus, which are, are like um, larger um, uh, worms that you can you know, buy for fishing and so on, um, and night crawlers, they call them. Uh, and then we measured every week, we measured uh, the height and then at harvest, we dried them and measured stem diameter and, um, and thickness of the leaf and that sort of thing. So what I, what I did here is I arrayed these, this is control, this is also control um, from left to uh, right the last three had worms in them. So you can kind of go up and down these um, columns and see that the latter three are always taller. It was exciting to see the impact of worms, um, which we kind of had a sense, you know, we've learned that agriculture and worms kind of work well together, but the biomass of corn increased when we had worms in our system. Um, and what their research showed um, was if you can see here, we're looking at um, the height and we're looking at the weight across the treatments. Um, the blue are the ones with worms um, and the red are the ones without worms. So just call your attention to the ones that are in red um, and you'll notice there is no difference in height uh, with control versus macro versus microplastic. There's no difference in weight 
versus control versus macro versus microplastic. And I thought that was kind of interesting. I sort of expected there might be um, a difference, um, but there was no difference in at least the five weeks that we were able to survey and get our results from. So plastic um, seemed to have no um, impact. I thought it even might have an impact on water holding properties. Um, an amendment did help in the growth of these plants, uh, whether or not it was you know, long enough for microplastic impacts, or maybe there is no microplastic impact as we're learning. Um, and worms across the board did help. So with that, thank you guys for hanging in. Um, I want to thank Sea Grant for funding the research as well as that SUNY Innovative Instructional Technology Grant that first connected me with Sherry Mason and helped me move from terrestrial systems into aquatic and give these students such an, an I think, incredible um, enriching opportunity, not just for me, but also hopefully for them as they move forward in their careers. Um, and all the helpers that have helped in getting the messaging out from those at Sea Grant and those in Basin Program, um, uh, Elizabeth Lee at the Maritime Museum, and everyone who helped out with the Lake Champlain Research Institute in terms of sampling and calculation and so on. Um, I am forever grateful. And I really hope that you guys, all of you out there who, who tuned in, go and, and share this messaging um, and, and just uh, increase the awareness on plastic pollution. Thank you for your attention. Awesome. Uh, big virtual round of applause for you, Danielle. Thank you so much. That was great. Um, just for all of you out there, we're going to do a brief question and answer session with some of the questions that you put in the chat box. If you have questions, you can go ahead and type them in there. You can also upload other people's questions uh, if you want to hear the answer to that question. Before we dive into that, though, please do stick around. Uh, after the brief question and answer session, we're going to have a take home activity for you all and a feedback poll, which uh, really helps out us out uh, if you stick around to answer that feedback poll. So if you can stay with us, uh, we would greatly appreciate it. So Danielle, uh, I'm gonna start sending some questions your way, uh, if that's all right with you. Yeah, yeah. Um, first up, uh, we have a question about the efficacy of uh, Cora balls. How effective are those in filtering yeah. out um, plastic fibers? And maybe you can talk about, maybe there's some studies about other aftermarket items. And I'm going to lump in another question about laundry, yeah. uh, about appliance manufacturers and their potential role in helping remove fibers. Mm -hmm. um, good, good question. So I'm, I'm trying to queue up an earlier version of my um, lecture that has, there's actually a study and I can share it out um, virtually um, for Nate to share with you guys. It's kind of warming up here. Um, there was a study that, that did control washing and then washing with the lint lover and then washing with the Corabal. Um, and what they found was Corabal does decrease the amount of um, particulate in the wa wash water. Um, and here it is right now. Um, Nate, can I share again? Yeah, absolutely. You can paste uh, a link if you have it right into the chat box. Oh, you're still sharing your screen, Danielle. By the way. Oh, I am. Okay. Thank yeah. you, guys. Oh, boy. <laughs> um, so here's the, the visual. So um, it's by Mc, McKill Wraith, um, and it was in 2019, so very recent. So people trying to test the efficacy as, as many of us are purchasing these items. I think it's that's a valid point. So this is the mean fibers per liter. Um, in the effluent of the wash, the lint lover versus the Corabal versus the control. So in many cases, we're finding both of them work. One may be more effective than the other. One is certainly more costly than the other too. So something to consider. I had hoped to maybe uh, install or see if we could get a green grant on our campus in some of the dorms um, to attach those um, aftermarket um, lint filters to them. But you have to empty them every certain amount of washes. And I figured that our students wouldn't necessarily be on that and it might cause a disaster. And, um, but I think in your own controlled home scenario um, that, that they would work. Uh, a Cora ball is around $20. And um, you know, given the results that we're seeing here, you can kind of uh, make an informed judgment. But I have one, I have a Patagonia um, uh, guppy friend bag as well. And the question about um, 
washing machine manufacturers, yes. I think there's been lots of discussions ongoing. I haven't seen any prototypes yet, um, but I know that the whole industry, garment industry, and I would assume um, equal uh, discussions going on in manufacturing, uh, you know, Maytag and so on, um, discussing how this might be um, uh, something to build in. Like we have our lint filters in our dryers, we could certainly, you know, have some sort of a device that we can um, put up, up on those other machines too. Yeah, cool. Thank you for that. I think it's interesting, like as these products start to pop up to mitigate this issue, right? Like having studies that back up okay, yeah. effective are these things and then even taking it in the next step where it's like, okay, how can we legislate a solution that's informed by science, right? Like if yeah. someone develops a prototype that's effective that can be implemented right. with legislation on and and passing it, you know, on to corporations who in theory have the uh, the greatest effect, right? If they if they implement a you know nationwide, industry wide solution. Um, yeah, I think that can be, that could be a, a pretty powerful thing to try to push for. Um, we have a question from Ben uh, about microplastic size. So a simple, but I think profound question, how small can a microplastic get? Oh. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I don't know if you want to take that and run with it uh, at sure. whatever level you choose. Yeah. Well, so I, I, um, I work with a lot of geologists. And so it was interesting to have conversations with them, you know, and as we talk about particle size, um, them mentioning that um, for them, uh, five millimeters does not seem micro at all. And, and to me, it doesn't seem micro at all. But these microplastics, there is an infinite size reduction that they can go through, right? And so there are nano and even below nano, if there is even a below nano, um, size particulate. So that is why, uh, you know, attention is turned in lab studies to whether or not this particulate, when it gets so fine, could actually enter um, the bloodstream, right? Um, and so that's, you know, can it enter the, the alveoli in the lungs and cause this irritation? Can it just get in there um, at that fine uh, nano size? So it's, it's yeah, scary. Yeah, jarring uh, to think about that sort of uh, the half-life, if you will, of like the size of microplastics and just the, the infinite scale of, of those those particles just getting smaller and smaller until perhaps they're mm -hmm. like out of our ability or maybe even science's ability to like readily and easily detect them, but just that they're like still there. <laughs> so it's, it's pretty wild to think about. Um, so there's another question here about uh, smart wool being a plastic. And I would maybe broaden this to like consumer guidelines about like how to be knowledgeable about your clothing and maybe picking right. clothing that's natural fibers versus synthetic. Uh, I don't right. know if you have any advice or maybe things. Yeah, yeah that, is a, that is a good question because um, there are natural fibers, you know, people have actually posed a question similar to this. Um, should we be worried about cotton? I mean, a fiber is a fiber. Yeah, if a uh, synthetic fiber gets stuck in a digestive tract and then leaches out its chemicals and gets into your, you know, bloodstream and so on. That is problematic. But what if that cotton fiber was floating in water in gasoline or in some noxious chemical? Can it behave the same way? Um, what if those um, smart, I don't think smart, but what if, what if cotton is treated with, um, with something that helps it live longer, have a longer, you know, lifespan. Um, and, and so anything that it's treated with, you know, has that possibility too. So um, I do know, and I've, I've met with folks over in Burton um, and I know Patagonia too, um, they, are, they are working really hard at trying to find the alternative um, particulate out there um, that won't, um, cause as much harm and will last a really long time. And I know Patagonia has that initiative to um, uh, sell your stuff on, on uh, eBay. 
and give it another life. And they also have like a traveling repair shop that helps. Um, and just the quality of a lot of the products at many of these kind of eco-minded uh, manufacturing um, companies is such that we want this to last your whole life. We will guarantee it to last because we don't want degradation. And so they do a lot of um, you know, quality control, quality assurance type measures. Um, so they're working hard to, to not just look for alternative materials, but also alternative weaves that will slough off less. Yeah, that's great. I think it's, it's always an interesting point to bring up and like how to be a conscious consumer. It's so mm -hmm. difficult these days and I feel like it's not getting any easier, mm -hmm. um, but it's nice to see that like some companies are working on making products last longer, which uh, hasn't historically always been the case, right? Uh, as we know, so. Um, and we can wash less. Like I think I, I've washed my fleece coat once in three years. <laughs> Yeah, and I have I, a white dog, which is bad. But. <laughs> yeah, I'm always proud to announce that I uh, haven't washed my one favorite ski, you know, like fleece layer uh, in, I don't know, th two, three years, maybe just because as soon as I wash it, it's just going to smell the next time anyway. So yeah. I might as well just not bother. It's, it's an outdoor. Uh... <laughs> so anyway, um, but we're going to jump uh, and transition now uh, just so we can get the feedback poll in and send you all home with a take-home activity but um, sincerely thanks again Danielle and uh, oh, thank you. your questions we'll try to follow up um, and I'm going to share Danielle's uh, email again in just a second um, and you'll be able to email her uh, questions or I can try to follow up uh, with some answers uh, to some of your questions as well. Um, so you should see her email, uh, on your screen right now. And Caroline's going to drop it in the chat box as well. Uh, you should also see the feedback poll popping up. So you can go ahead, uh, if you wouldn't mind taking a minute or two to go ahead and, uh, answer the three questions, four questions that are in that feedback poll helps us out tremendously. I'm going to stop my video. I feel uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's Thank cool. you all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so go ahead and uh, you can go through that feedback poll. Uh, give us your honest feedback. Super helpful. Um, we won't share these results with everyone, so don't worry about it. Uh, your feedback's anonymous. And then uh, if for some reason the polling feature isn't working for you, you can type any general feedback you have uh, directly to us in the chat box. That's a great place to put it. Um, same thing if you're joining us on YouTube. But I'm going to let this feedback poll run uh, for a couple more minutes and give folks a chance to, uh, to fill that out. Um, as folks are finishing up this feedback poll, which we do greatly appreciate, uh, I'm going to send you all home with a take home activity if you'd like. Uh, so I would like to encourage you all to uh, plan or make a pledge to do a local stream buffer, beach, or roadside cleanup uh, in honor of the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Um, so obviously we live in strange times due to COVID, um, but hopefully in the near future, you'll be able to feel, uh, safe going out and doing a cleanup and doing your part to pitch in, uh, to help steward our basin. Um, so hopefully you can make a plan to do, do something like that, uh, in the spirit of Earth Day, uh, which was just this last Wednesday. Um. Another activity you can do uh, is spend a week tracking your plastic use uh, and then use the plastic footprint calculator that uh, Caroline is going to put a link to in the chat box uh, to determine how much plastic you might use in a year and might use over your lifetime. And then see if you can't make a plan to reduce that plastic. I know it's challenging sometimes and of course there are instances as Danielle highlighted, which I really appreciated where plastic is really useful and essential for maybe, you know, public safety or, or healthcare. Um, but perhaps there are 
ways or instances where you don't need to use plastic and there is an easy alternative to implement into your everyday life. And I would uh, encourage you to make a plan to make that reduction. Uh, and if you come up with a cool plan or you spend an afternoon cleaning up uh, your local stream or your neighborhood cul-de-sac and you want to share that with us, we'd love to see that on Instagram. You can see our Instagram handle uh, down there below, or you can share it with us on 